there, there's a, a thing called the synthesis essay. I teach a class called AP English Language and Composition. And so there really is a thing called the synthesis essay. What are the three essays they have to write to get college credit at the end of the year? Mm -hmm. So that's called the synthesis essay. And that's where they're given six to eight sources and they have to build, you know, an argument around it, mm -hmm. take a position on it. <clears throat> and so right, I'm well, saying this is... Chris, I just want to interrupt on the recording here and say welcome to Teacher Teaching Teachers. And Chris Sloan is just giving you a preview of what he's going to be talking about in the next 15 or 20 minutes. Mm. Um, our, our notion here is, I was thinking that we do this every year around this time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We circle around and, and Chris has been doing this project for several years at least. I don't want to count. Um, and you're going to just explain what that is. Um, uh, part of the question I think we want to ask this year is when and where AI can impact on this project. If that's your game to play with that question. Sure. You bet. Okay. So on the table in the middle is a document that, is it worth following along, Chris, or do you want to just- Oh, uh, well, I'm going to be uh, reading it or, you know, following okay. along with it myself, so. So we, we should do quick introductions. <coughs> Noah's here, Bob Montgomery's here. Um, two guys we were just saying from San Francisco, uh, David Cole from um, Next Map and old friend of Writing Project and Bob Montgomery from West Ed old friend of the writing project and old people from the writing now and Christina Cantrell and Jack are here old. <laughs> and Chris Sloan is here and we're hoping um, a couple of other people will be joining us in a second as well to talk about um, their spring projects and and we're going to kind of question and challenge and think about how AI might fit some of that work. Chris over to you. Sure. Um, so um, I teach a class called AP English Language and Composition, but this doesn't have to be done just in that class. But anyway, there is a, uh, a task called the synthesis essay where on the AP exam at the end of the year, students need to write a few essays. And so this is one of those essays where they get six to eight sources and they have to build an argument around it. And so I feel like we're going to be joined by someone pretty quick. Yeah, Maybe. we can we can say hello to him, and then he can join us. Aditya, right? Did I say your name right? Yes. Cool, cool. Welcome. By the way, I saw some of the work you're doing on debate, and uh, maybe we'll find some room to look at that with you. Okay. But first, we're going to look at um, Chris Sloan, teacher in Utah's work. Just feel free to jump in and contribute as much as you'd like. Is that okay? Welcome. Introduce uh, okay. yourself briefly, though. It's okay. Do you want to say who you are and where, you, or I will? Is he here? I'm not sure. Well, he's a, a, a Dikia is a, a student in. Um, New Jersey, uh, eighth grade student who's been messing with thinking partners and doing other work as well. Um, okay, go ahead, Chris. Sure. So um, it's a six week thing that my students are going to do and they're going to wrap it up by the end of the third quarter. So basically they're developing a position on a problem in the world that they think needs addressing. And it could be like the world could be like a real local thing. So I should probably say community that needs addressing. Um, so, you know, they have to analyze the problem, establish that it's serious enough to need solving, and then offer a solution that will maybe help it a little bit, maybe not solve it all the way, but that's the kind of thing. Um, they have to think about stakeholders though, like who's the audience for this thing. And, um, you know, sometimes this will turn into maybe like a long letter or that kind of thing, some kind of thing that where they're gonna address a stakeholder in their community or some people who might be able to address the issue or the problem. Um, you know, like in argumentation, they're supposed to um, think of objections people might have and alternative solutions that maybe people have even tried um, 
and then over the next six weeks have you started uh, it yet no it's starting next week okay okay uh, i was just fixing this while i'm doing it. uh over the next six weeks uh they're going to annotate sources provide summaries and develop their own position on the most important factors stakeholders need to consider when addressing the problem so uh Chris, you know can i, can I just yeah, uh go right just ahead check in on a question when this is in a test they're given the sources yeah so yes uh -huh. but okay this one they have to, they're going to go find their own sources okay an important yeah. distinction i think but yeah go yeah. Ahead. yeah yeah so you know it's inquiry and so they will revisit the inquiry questions and i don't know if this this might be kind of locked down where you all are but basically you know it's like the 10 questions they have about themselves or the world you know that they had in the first semester some inquiry questions so they might look at those and think like, oh yeah, there's a question I still want to explore. Or they may think like, no, there's, I need to do something else. So they're gonna use the UN sustainable goals, which are surrounding us in um, Kumo space right now as the organizing principle. So I don't know if I need to slow down at that moment or what. Any, anybody want to further detail on that? Chris, I have a question. This is just mm -hmm. about the, this sort of gen general about the taxonomy that you're using in the in the in the assignment. The uh, annotate, summarize, and th synthesize is that three is that three move design something you use consistently in your writing project writing work generally, or is that specific to this assignment? Uh, it's not the first time they've done it. Yeah, yeah. So that they're used to moving in stages <clears throat> through a writing assignment over like you're doing your six week interval. Annotate. Oh, well. Yeah. I don't know about six weeks, but we've we've done that iteration where they, you know, do some research, they get an article and annotate, and then theoretically some other people could chime in on those annotations. But then after that, they kind of summarize mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. So Chris. Um, yeah. I'm realizing that you should probably share a screen. Oh, okay. Sure. I'm I'm Marina. All right. I will share my screen. You can see that okay? Yes. Uh, and there is in the upper right hand corner a I hate to say that again, but a um a plus sign in a magnifying glass that you can enlarge it if you'd like as well. Go ahead. You talking to me? No. Oh. Sorry, I was talking to everybody who's who has a screen open. Okay. So, um, so any problem that they can think of in any community, I believe can be um, put into the these organizing principles, these sustainable goals. And um, so, you know, like they work for worldwide things and global things, but also I, I'm pretty sure we always can find whatever question they have kind of falls under those categories, uh, which seems like a good thing to, to know for them. Um, so. What's your sense? Then, do, they, do they have questions already ready to go or are they starting? I think they'll come to them fairly quickly. Um, because I'm going to also, you know, they're, they're seniors. And so I'm going to say you are, they're all going to be legal, oh, well, eligible to vote in the fall. And so, um, you know, definitely having them think about um, those issues that a lot of them are already thinking about, even in just their other, you know, American government class or what have you. So, um, yeah. So I think their questions, they'll be pretty quick to those. When is, when is the first time they publish on Youth Voices? Well, the first one was way back in something. No, I mean uh, for this project, sorry. So, well, good question. <laughs> um, that is coming up. Uh, if you look down at um, 
in my step three, which I don't mm -hmm. know if steps is the best way to talk about it, but these dates are actually subject to change there. Um, whoops. Um, those dates are actually wrong. I'm going to just swap that out really quick. Do, do, do. Boom. Okay. Um, so week two, at the end of week two. So next week will be the week where they start to, um, you know, they'll get their question and they'll uh, annotate some article next week. And that'll be the kind of the, the main goal of that first week. And there's going to be questions about just the interface and things like that. So um, don't want to rush it. They're, they're first publishing stuff for sure on Youth Voices two weeks. So that I'm planning on that being you know, the week of February 5th. And in that they're defining the problem, they're summarizing a few things they found. What yeah. Are they doing? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So, um, so first thing, you know, step two, they annotate as I see it. And they'll um, also, the reason it takes a while in that first week is I want to talk to them about the idea of these collections and that other people have um, used them in the past and they can add to those. They could also, you know, like those collections exist, they could use a resource that's already there that someone had put in there into the now comment study groups. Um, I think I usually say something like the first week I want them to add to it uh, and then they can use some things that are already there after that. Yeah, so they just find sources that um, inform their inquiry question and uh, they annotate those and then kind of whip it up into here's what I found this week. But, you know, they also, they just need to be able to find other things, not just text. They need to find some kind of visuals, charts, illustrations, videos, et cetera. Um, and then I say, you know, you could consider using those things right there um, because there's already like Solutions U, I think is, you know, worth looking at. Um, you know, so we spend some time talking about solutions. You do uh, that. Week. Uh, okay. We're okay. And, we got some feedback coming, but you're okay. Okay. So, yeah, I thought maybe someone was talking, but I think that was just feedback. Um. So then, Chris, I am yeah. ready to interrupt you. Go right ahead. Yeah. Um. With this question. So. Some of the things you did last year with AI was that first post, that summary post of things they've reviewed that they've been reading. You had mm -hmm. them have AI do a summary and compare well, that summary, right? Right. I had them, the students do a summary first, and then I had AI do a summary of that same article and they would compare that to whether you know they got the main points out of the article or not, just as a little thought experiment. And that was all on Youth Voices. And so I, I just want to brainstorm with you. We haven't talked about this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can talk about it whenever you'd like. How mm -hmm. you are thinking about using thinking partners on Now Comment and or the templates on Youth Voices, kind of back and forth. You don't, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't have to be an ultimate answer there, but that's what yeah. you're thinking about a little bit. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is that summary check that we just did. Most of them are pretty, pretty good at summarizing main ideas from articles. Um, but I would also say it seems like, I don't know if devil's advocate is the right word, but um, using a thinking partner to explore alternative perspectives to the problem they're looking at, um, that seems like... Um, and I, don't, I haven't looked yet whether we have one like that or not. Um, there is. What, yes. What's it called? There is both, both on Youth Voices and on Now Comment. Um, like a, I think it's uh, I, I don't remember the exact name, but I'll I'll look it up. Well, I guess I'm bringing it up now because I think mm -hmm. like if we're using the UN Sustainable Goals, mm -hmm. it's more like other perspectives too. So it's not necessarily like devil's advocate um, because it may just be like, ideally, it would be like another community looked at the same thing with a different lens, maybe. So it's not necessarily pushing a different argument. I don't know. So Mike, get back to your um, 
what did you call them? Um, stakeholders, right? Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, like difference, don't, I mean, depending on the problem, uh, the different, I mean, the West. So, you know, let's say water is the issue. Different stakeholder could be an alfalfa farmer. Um, you know, so they, they all want water, you know, so that might be, um, a different perspective, not necessarily the opposite side is what I'm getting at. Um, but you know, things like we do have also, um, our state gives all students access to the Gale database, uh, of opposing viewpoints. So that's, you know, something I'll have them go to. Um, because it is a resource, it's a database that taxpayers pay for. And I feel like my students, a lot of them are going to go to college. And so they'll probably have to navigate specialized databases. So it seems like an okay thing to do. Um, so some of the weeks as we're going through, you know, we're actually, I'm saying like, let's go to this database and see what we can find. And, and how useful is that for your particular question? So different databases are better for some questions, and I think that's a good thing for them to think about. Um, and Chris, I, I know you haven't got through the whole project, yeah. But could could we pause though? And I want I want to ask Aditya, who has been doing some res finding resources and using thinking partners in different ways, see if he could contribute some of his thoughts around all that and posing viewpoints. Is that okay? Sure. Uh, hello, my name is Aditya. Um, Thanks. So I am a fifth, uh, eighth grader in uh, William Anna Middle School in New Jersey. And uh, I'm on the school's debate team, right? Um, and I was just thinking that, uh, and one day I was thinking, like uh, we uh, so we usually have like a few debates per year, and at the last debate, I, I realized something. So um, how it works for our debate team is that you prep the uh, you prep points beforehand, and then you go and debate with others with teams from other schools. And at the last debate, we did our team did not do so well, and we realized that the reason was because we had a lot. We spent all our time generating arguments instead of like finding evidence for them. And I was thinking, is there any way to uh, you know, make that process of generating arguments more efficient. And then I thought, well, we're doing this in Mr. Ronsky's uh, language arts class. So I was like, so I decided to try it out. And I created a thinking partner that um, it, I did go through, like I did revise it a little, but uh, originally what it did is I gave it a few. You want, do you want to share a screen and show what you did? Oh, yeah, I can. Is that possible? Chris, do you mind? Yeah. Screen. So, over here, this is the original uh, thing I made. So I tested it out with one of my topics from my last debate where I didn't do so well. So um, the topic was to make organ donation compulsory and I gave it the three points that I ended up using in that debate. And then it returned me this speech. And then I was thinking about it and I realized that ultimately this thinking partner wouldn't be that useful for me because the way that I generally work in my debate team is I'll create some points and then while I'm going, I'll kind of uh, make up the whole speech on the spot, depending on like, especially since I'm like uh, more of a position where I, uh, I'm i a rebuttalist. So I help, so I rebut against what the others are saying. So I was thinking, what well, wouldn't it be nice if I could just give it the topic and then it just generates a few bullet points for me and then I could just expand the points with evidence. So that's what I ended up doing. And this is another one of our first topics. So cultural treasures should be returned to their countries of origin. So I gave it that and then it returned me back uh, these three points about uh cultural treasures um do you, do you remember what your prompt was for this one this is the uh, can, expansion partner yeah, yeah so my prompt for this one was i can i can just It'll take too long. oh you can okay yeah go for it and then i can see um, there we go so my point was it for the so here's my prompt so uh I told it to talk like an eighth grader because we're like an eighth grade debate. I didn't really want it to talk like someone. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to like, I think my teacher was saying um, that if you don't like truly, uh, if you use words and you don't truly understand what they mean, then you essentially, then you lose the credibility you might have. Um, 
And so then I told it to, to, uh, to take a topic and make a few bullet pointed arguments with logic based evidence. Like, I know that sometimes like, because this is just essentially taking data from the internet and just uh, uh, combining it and spitting it back out. I didn't want it to make up based statistics. So this was like one of my most important parts when I created this was I wanted it to be extremely logic based so that I could support it with evidence later. I even reaffirmed that do not make up statistics. Um, and it's just like a little bit about how we debate. Uh, there's one judge and two teams. And it wasn't overly complicated of a prompt, I, but I think it's pretty complicated. But go ahead, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Now I, I see what you mean, though. Uh, but yeah, and then I also I, did. You mean, really thought through what you wanted it to do. Yeah, I mean. and then I also added one last thing uh, in between this time and the last time I was talking about this. So during a debate, one. Um, during our style of parliamentary debate, what you can do is if the other, uh, if your opponents are talking, so for example, uh, let's say that we're on that organ donation topic, you're saying that organ donation should be a thing, um, and then the other team is arguing that it should not be compulsory, you and you have some, and they, they mention like a point, like, uh, oh, it violates, um, what's some of the points I used for that? Oh, it violates um, right to religion. And then if I had a point that countered that, you are allowed to stand up, say, I have a POI, and then you can mention counter arguments to their arguments. So then what I did is I had it take all of the, um, uh, I, I gave it like some points that, that was generated above, like I just copied and pasted it. Um, so this uh, one of our arguments for this debate is on, um, uh, creating a national DNA database uh, for like crimes and missing persons and stuff. And um, I, I gave it those points and it gave me like counter arguments that I could potentially use. So it violates privacy, um, it could be misused, um, like the false positives and how that might affect someone like giving a false guilty verdict, um, ethics. And uh, I haven't really gotten a chance to use it too much um, but I want to use it a little more before the debate and kind of pre-prep some rebuttals that I can use because I feel like so I, I wanted to check what you just said. So you're using, you, you're not using this during the debate. You probably wouldn't be allowed to, right? Yeah. So what we do is we pre-prep this and then I have a doc over here that, I I can share that one with you too. Um, present, um, where's the sh present and then I can show you um I, I think Vishnu was on this calls a while back right uh right Mr. Allison he was yeah so he's on my debate team alongside this other kid in school and so what we do is um you'll see that we have all these uh bullet points so I can uh, ignore that some when a, with a public doc other kids <laughs> sometimes just post random things um so I I have like the arguments I created over here um so, for example, I can actually just go to the one I was talking about earlier, the DNA database. Uh -huh. And then over here, I have the uh, arguments on as to why the D a DNA database would be helpful. And uh, this is how we generally operate. But we also create, like, um, sometimes we create counter arguments uh, <laughs> um, to everybody else's. Uh, so we create right. counter arguments and then. There, uh, there were, I, I hate to interrupt you. <laughs> but it's yeah, like I, I hated to interrupt Chris. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to pull this around a little bit. And when you get the, the point of interest, the POIs, right? is that what those are? Right? Yeah. Um, do, you, do you then find evidence for those? And have you uh, been so, able to? Yeah. So as that's, for where, the... that's where Chris would. There, Chris has. So, Mr. Chris Sloan in, in Salt Lake City has his seniors doing a research project, right? So in yeah. that way, it's kind of similar. Um, and they're finding arguments and counter arguments, and they're finding evidence for those. Is that fair, Chris? That's yeah, mm -hmm. somewhat similar. So how have you used thinking partners to support that? Or how can you imagine that? Or what are you thinking about? Yeah, so I think to address your earlier question about how our debate works, so we pre-prep things, and then 
basically have this giant dock, and then we have to tame it, uh, tear it down to like two sheets per topic that we bring into the room, and we're not allowed anything else. We're not allowed computers or anything. We aren't. We aren't allowed to find new facts in the spot to counter POIs, for example. Um, so that's why prepping arguments and kind of understanding your argument beforehand is extremely important, so that you're knowledgeable on your topic and you can kind of address those POIs on the fly. Um, uh, but yeah, um, so that's that's kind of what I've been doing with it. And uh, what was your earlier question? What was your question about uh, similarities? And I was, I was I was trying to figure out how you find evidence to support the POIs. Yeah. Uh, so my so POIs are generally logic based. Is like you don't really have time. Like if you're being asked a question on the spot, you you aren't really able to get evidence unless you have something that you uh, really know beforehand because you don't know what your opponent's going to say like there's only so much that you can prep beforehand and uh so I, and in terms of getting evidence for the main points what i do is i'll find points there's some really good statistic based ones i think up here so you can see uh how i've since statistics like uh, this is an argument about uh, uh about increasing voter turnout um, mm -hmm. um, by making election day a federal holiday. So I have statistics, for example, how Germany has a uh, Germany has a ten percent higher voter turnout than the USA, and their election day is a national holiday. So I was so 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 I so originally I had it uh, where I it, it gave me this point. Actually, it gave me like a slightly different point, but I modified it a little bit, flipped it on, uh, flipped it a little bit. But and then it gave me this point, and then I found this statistic to support it. Or um, it, uh, we have one argument: texting does more harm than good. Um, and then obviously one big part of this is um, um, how is it? Uh, texting and driving, right? And this is this is one of the top points it gave me on road safety. And I, I pulled statistics from the um, um, from I don't remember which. Uh, Department of Government, but um, I remember uh, it, was, it was a Department of uh, this government website had statistics on how many people actually died due to distracted driving um, right. in 2021, and then I I'm able to use that. So this is a very logic-based argument. This, but it might not stand on. But generally, these points don't really stand on their own without statistics, like. If you have no statistics to back up this argument, they can just say, yeah, that's a small number. It doesn't matter. But if you have a number, then you can point to it like, wow, judge, 32,000 people died from distracting driving between 2012 and 2021 alone. That's a massive amount of people. So you can point to that to kind of counter that. And that's why I think evidence is so important. But if I, but by having AI. But, on, so, uh, but I just, I'm just trying to interpret this a little bit. Um, and others, please help, help out here. Um, so you use the thinking partners to get logical evidence, but yeah. not to get but not to get statistical evidence. Yeah, that's essentially what I'm doing. That's that's I think the best way to sum it up. Okay. That's that seems smart. Why did you decide that? Cuz I know sometimes that like AI might not uh, I have it's more uh, the statistics I might not give me might not be the best quality for stop. It doesn't cite sources, which I think is currently a massive problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd have no idea where those statistics are coming from. Um, and uh, that's that was one problem for me. Whereas with logic, it's like pretty easy to think through why this would be a why um, it's pretty easy for the judge, especially to think that this uh, to think through why this is a point and why this is a valid point. OK, Whereas let's let, yeah, cool, cool. Let's come back to Chris for a second. And yeah, others here, please help yeah. make this. A little more coherent for us in some way. Thank you. And Chris, do you do you see? I just love any, hearing Aditya that, talk about his work. I, so thank you. <laughs> I, I I do too. But yeah. yeah. I know. I know you do. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Cool. Chris, what are you thinking as you see some? Of uh, I think we're on the same page. Actually, um, my students use the thinking partners, or in the past anyway to help them uh, come up with alternative perspectives. Like I mentioned before, it definitely wasn't go find me this information. I have not had much luck with students still um, getting sources that way. Mm -hmm. 
by much luck, I mean, I haven't seen it yet where they actually get the, the, the research course. partner is a pretty, it does a pretty decent job. You might try that a little bit. Getting wonder, actual sources. Yeah. I want to, I wonder, and you don't have to make any decisions on this at all ever. Right. But I do want to kind of make clear and, and some of the other people um, um, here um, have been thinking about like, how youth voices, how templates on youth voices and doc and um, thinking partners on now comment, which is different than you had. You didn't have that option last year as much. Uh, which one on now comment or? Yeah. Like most every, right. most, of, most of the templates, like the counter argument is a good example. You can do that on, on youth voices or you can do it on now comment. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering which, which place, you are going which play which platform you're going to use as a writing place right and i know you use docs as well um but do you think your students would put a draft up on now comment use a use a use a variety of thinking partners to get feedback on that and then post on youth voices or would they just go directly to youth voices again you don't have to answer this i just wanted you to be aware of the the possibilities there does that make yeah. sense yeah i mean in general i guess i would i have thought of now comment as first off that's where i put my stuff as a mm -hmm. student you know and if i'm in one of these study groups so i want them to group by the by my stuff you mean the stuff you've found right yeah the students yeah the their research their, their research. articles that they're annotating so at first it's like an individual kind of thing mm -hmm. but you know i'm trying to encourage them to uh, be in these study groups around like the bigger goal. Um, and so that, you know, that would take place all in now comment the way I'm seeing it. And then the way I think of docs, you know, Google docs is where I do my, this is how I think of it. I'm doing my thinking, my kind of private brain, brainstorming kind of stuff and maybe, you know, shaping up a draft. And then youth voices is more the public writing that would be for a larger community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talk about how those are different, you know, like I write in each of those places, my writing is going to be a little bit different because of the audience and, you know, I, I'll have to think whether that's a, an okay conception of those audiences, but um, the audience seems to um, influence I, the that's all, That all feels like really helpful thinking mm -hmm. you're doing on that. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to present the idea because it's in your practice so far, you haven't used now comment as a writing platform, right? So the students could take- No, that's not true uh, because oh, we use oh. it for the college essays. They put their- Oh, I'm um, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in this project, it hasn't been used as- So do you think there could be a natural flow where they could put their college essays, not their college essays, but these drafts in now comment too and- does that make any sense? And I don't have an answer to that. I, I'll um, ask what you're saying. Yeah. I'll think about it. I don't can know. I ask, can I ask okay. a related question, Paul? Please, yeah. And and as and Chris, you can speak to this too. Paul, it sounds like you're asking, is there a, for lack of a better phrase, an, a, a, a sequence or an order of operations that you might use to, to go to take your writing to a public space? where the audience is doing a certain thing. Now comment seems to be about, for lack of a better term, metacognition organizing. I, I, Aditya, I love this phrase, he says pre, what was your phrase? Pre prep some rebuttals. I mean, that seemed like a really great description of gathering information that has an associative logic to it and coming to some terms of it so that you can understand it, so you can take it public, so to speak, you can take it to your debate. And Paul, what I hear in your question, this is my question for you, are you suggesting that now comment with these various features can be the sandbox where that happens and then it goes out into these different venues or are they all meant to sort of happen in whatever sequence people want to do it? Chris, I heard you saying you write in different places for different needs. Do you ever use all of them for the same project? It sounds like you do. Yeah. Yeah. All, all three would be used in this project. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, youth voices has, I think more um, it's, it has more ease of use as far as multimedia elements, maybe. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, yeah, 
thank you for saying I'll think about it <laughs> because that's all I wanted to do is put this out as a, a question and and yes, figuring out what when we need AI to support our thinking and when we need it to help us bring something to publishing, I think all of those are really good questions to be asking and to be aware of, right? And which platforms do what? So I I don't have any, <laughs> again, I don't have any answers to how that works, but I, I think we need to think about it as, right? That's fair. So David, thanks for clarifying some of this. I, I am- Thank you, thank you. I thought it was, it was interesting. It's, it's really interesting, Aditya. Thank you so much for sharing that process. It's really interesting to hear that. There's so much activity going on in what you're putting together. It's great, really inspiring. I want to leave room for Marina. Um, and so there's much, much more we could go into here. But Marina, are you ready to present some of what you're up to and what you're thinking about? And are you there? I'm here. <laughs> yeah, there you are. OK, great, great, great. OK. Um, and, and it and is sort of a shift, but I think that's OK. Yeah. Well, what have your students been doing? What have you been doing with your third graders? Okay, so um, we right now we've been doing a collaborative project with our art educator as well as our school media library specialist. And the students read a book called Blue, which is about the history of the color blue. And the art teacher has started this project with them last year where they they learned obviously about the colors and then the shades and hues and different names of for different colors for blue. Um, and then also they looked at gemstones and then they had created some, you know, some drawings and they watercolor. So it, it was kind of just started in art. And then this year we kind of wanted to do more with it. So um, the, our, our librarian was involved because she actually did the reading and she's been reading um stories that are connected with different colors and um but in my classroom we've kind of taken the work and the students did research on their birthstones which is what the art teacher was going to also have them um kind of study and then create an art and at, at what point can you start sharing or yeah, so I don't have it set up, so I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> You're asking okay. me to share all this stuff. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so we can talk until you're ready. <laughs> I think basically, yes, and we can also just wait for you to get it. Our goal from the classroom side was to help our students create in a poem that connected with their identity and based on their research from their birthstones that could be a part of their artwork. Mm -hmm. So how is, you know, AI involved in that? Well, one thing that I did is I actually used AI to generate some passages for each of the birthstones with all of the kind of parameters that I wanted the kids to kind of like think about, like where some of these gemstones and birthstones are found in the world and how they're made in a way that could be, you know, explained by a third grader, understood by a third grader. And then, um, famous examples and, and things of that sort. And then I took all those passages and each of the kids got one of the passages and we did, they did some research, but then after that they did blackout poetry where they like went through, basically what they did is they went through um, the writing and so they this was, circled. This was AI generated writing that they did blackout poetry on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the prompt I basically said was, you know, can you um, make a, make a nonfiction article for at a third grade reading level that include about a topaz that includes where it can be found naturally and, you know, all those different parameters of information that I wanted to 
have the kids kind of think a little bit into. And um, it did and use some really engaging language, which is really great. So they had some really vibrant vocabulary to think about. And um, so they use, so after they use that for research, then they actually also did the blackout poetry where they went through it line by line and they circled words and phrases that they really liked. And then they extracted those and they had to kind of think to, like, we kind of like led this, I led them through this activity, like this sounds like me. So for each of the phrases, they had to kind of evaluate whether or not it matched their personality for who they are and who, the, you know, all of that. And then um, we started composing using a template and then we kind of broke some template rules. Um, so we used like the, the I, I poem, so list poems. And then after they generated poems, I put their poems into um, Bing and got um, images that matched their poems. Hmm. So not only are they making hand art, but then they have this generative art. So I can show a couple, I guess. Um, I forgot so how to share on this again. Down under present. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I knew it would be worth it. <laughs> My title um, slide is gone. Thank you, you say? thank you for going through the whole process. I think, but yeah, go ahead. I yeah, said I knew it would be sorry, worth it. I am a little tired too. So <laughs> if I'm rambling, I'm sorry. No, I um, appreciate it. So, yeah. So basically, this is kind of what we did. Like, so we have a couple of them. I, um, and this is kind of like where we're leaving it off and now the art teachers taking it back. And what I should say that, um, are there I other I, examples? Sorry. There are, but can I finish just saying what I, I, the last thing I was gonna say? Yes. Sorry. You know. <laughs> um, Thanks for being that way. Go what I was going to say is that, um, I know a couple of you in the summertime, I was like I was talking about, about how I was using thinking partners for my own poetry and using images and kind of like having the thinking partners talk back, like what do they see in my poems or what things like that. So I really like used a lot of my own experience from the summer to think more about this. And I kind of didn't want to just leave it. Um, so what I did is also I had the students, um, we regenerated a second set. And what I do is I screenshot all because they don't have access to this. It's it's disabled for them. But I, I, I make take a screenshot of all the different um, possibilities. And then we went through another exercise where they looked at a new picture that was still connected with their poem. And they um, looked for another idea that they could add in. So like really their like last line is is something a little bit more authentic too. So, you know, um, I kind of wanted something. So this is one of them so I can show you. So we had a, a peridot, um, a topaz. <laughs> And uh, an emerald. A slope. So you, can see, yeah, yeah. you know, and what I found was like a lot of the pictures were just like so magical. They they felt like um, they could be the start of <clears throat> like um, fantasy stories or something. What what um, image generator did you use? Um, Bing Chat, which I think is Copilot now because they have a Dolly in it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Dolly. Um, so what did the student added some of her Go ahead, um, L1 language one her first language too huh. how did they respond to some of this? they loved it <laughs> meaning what <laughs> they're like whoa you know they're little so like they see these and they're like they're amazed by it and what I put in, I didn't just take, I, I should say it, I didn't just take the poem and put it in. I wrote like, I am eight years old and I just wrote this poem about my birthstone. Can you make me a picture that matches my poem? <laughs> and some I did add, I, I'm not going to lie, some I did like make it look magical because I wanted mm -hmm. to have that like, that element, you know? Um mm -hmm. cool. cool. 
Yeah. We're also doing a lot of like work with fluency to reading fluency. So there, there's, it's just like so multifaceted. So like, I know like I'm kind of saying all the different strands here, but there's so much more we're working on fluency. So they, they're orally recording their poems. Um, you know, the, we use Sway cause we're the Microsoft district and, um, they're putting this work onto their Sway. So they're like doing more work in that way. So more multimodal type of composition as well. Um, seeing in different ways too. So yeah. Thoughts, thoughts and questions for Marina. In addition to thank you for sharing what you're doing. Marina, when you say you were you would you would run us want to run a review or another cycle where you would you would print out what was brought in. Did they appreciate how did they take to that? I mean, they were they were looking at screenshots of things you had gone and gotten off of the the chat GPT cycle. Yeah. So we've we've already done it a couple of times in different ways. So mm -hmm. they're kind I, I think they're just get like really excited when we're doing anything that's connected with the AI, as they call it. Uh -huh. the sure. AI. Um <laughs> Mm -hmm. And um, they, think it's they never they they didn't see thing. things like this yet. So the last thing I did with them was they were doing we did that um that very popular Lego challenge a couple weeks ago where they had to write a personal uh, a prompt on their you know their personal um, identity and they got little Legos and some of them liked their Legos and some of them were like nope that's not me and we had to go back in and revise and they were okay with that so i think they're getting a lot they're understanding a lot more that they don't get back what they're looking for what they're hoping for they're envisioning without some you know more clarity and precision mm -hmm. which i like about it because then that's you know helping them to improve their communication both you know orally and um in writing as well too would you say that the use of the ai is speeding up their the cycles of revision and their attention in that process, or is it sort of happening in the same mm -hmm. way that it was before the AI? I think that this is very engaging writing for these children. And I think that this component makes it even more purposeful for them. Oh. Um, I will be a hundred percent honest with you too, especially because we've talked about this. We two of during this little mini unit we did, the students also wrote two paragraphs, right? Mm -hmm. So they had to do, one, it kind of started with like their favorite color and that was kind of the intro into it. And then later on, they made a paragraph about the research that they learned from their um, birthstone. And that has a lot to do with the fact that my school's kind of doing um, a lot of training around the writing revolution and the structures of that. So what wow. I really liked about this was that um, it, was, it was building in opportunities for more structured writing and then also for more like freeform writing that certainly had structure. And mm. what I will say is really, what really like um, made me feel good is our um, school media library specialist said that um, when the kids went to the library session and they were sharing the work that they were doing here with the poems, they were also saying like, and we're writing paragraphs. Like they were super excited about it, which is like not something that people usually get excited about, right? <laughs> Sorry. Right? Am I? Did I offend anyone? I'm sorry if I did. No, no, no. But it's accurate. Yeah. They yeah. don't. Sorry. Right. I'm, I'm sorry. They don't. It's you know. And so, um. Anyway, so I liked the the whole juxtaposition, and then they put those paragraphs on the sway. So I think it's like it's kind of like a little bit of like, and I feel like you know going back to two weeks ago, like Paul, we were talking about letters to the next mayor, and you'd asked about me 10 years ago if fourth graders could do that and i was like yeah they absolutely could they had, they had just come off of their new york state tests and they had been doing all of this essay prep for their new york state tests and what was really great about this was like they were still using the same formats they didn't like you know necessarily think about it as an essay anymore um so i think like i tr i try to think about that with what i offer my students because i don't want to I want them to be excited and to love writing and to know that those structure pieces, like those paragraphs and essays too, are, are what's going to help them really get their message out um, so that people listening to it, you know, know what they're trying to say and have more clarity around it. So, I don't know. Nice. Thanks. Cool, cool. I, while you're still talking, can you introduce, so 
<laughs> this book, is it? does it appear backwards when I show it? I don't know. Um, the Generative Age, Alana Winnick is coming next week um, to talk to us about this book and the work she's been doing with you. Marina, can you tell us a little more about her? <laughs> sure. She's your friend and yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so Al Alana is Alana Winnick is the um, our director of technology at my school, but she did just publish a book on generative AI in I think it was published in July or August. So it's you know it's fairly new, and she wrote it up really quickly. Um, and it my has, book says it was printed January twenty second. Really? <laughs> anyway, I'm Maybe your talking. version. I don't it know. I don't think there's yeah. any changes. No, it, it, was, it was published this <laughs> last year. You're right. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, Alana and I did some work actually in September, like almost when school started right away with the students um, around prompt engineering and generative art. And that's really been our work. And But it wasn't just like, oh, let's just teach the kids to write and then put it into the you know, AI. And we did a lot of work on building the connections between computational thinking and um, computer science. We, it, but then also from the writing world, like the revising, the editing, um, the vocabulary work, the grammar work, and kind of looking at it through a lens of, you know, how would we talk about that as computer scientists? And um I think it, it it really went very well, and she's actually rolled that out to all the classes in our school. So um, our students don't have access to any anything independently, although there is, in Padlet, we do have accounts to Padlet, and there is like an I can't draw, and that actually is, um, you know, that's, you can put a prompt in and it will generate some art for you. That's a, that's a terribly interesting issue that, Maybe she can help us think about too, because Which she one? must be involved. The, the, like teacher mediated work around the AI, which is mm -hmm. where your just your school and district seems to be, and that, you know mm -hmm. maybe that's the best way to go. Um, but I'd love to hear. Like she must have some ideas about policy around that and and why yeah. and so forth. Yeah. She has a lot of thoughts on that. Okay. You know, yeah. I think there's a whole. I, I mean, I there's a whole part in her book about it and. Um, she's about, you know, she's really about like getting people to understand like that, you know, it can really help make, um, you more productive. We, she had, uh, I, a couple of months ago, like three of us in the school, I was one of them, um, kind of led some mini workshops for the teachers, kind of like a quick, like lightning, like go around. Um, the one that I did was about, you know, using it for lesson prompting. So we, we as teachers, we have um, access to Bing Chat co or Copilot. I think it changed over to now. Um, the students don't, but. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool. I, I, um, I see some students coming in and we can talk to them if, <laughs> if they would like to. Um, but um, we're sort of done with this hour, I think. Thank you so much, Marina, for presenting, and, and thank you for connecting us with Alana, and it should be an interesting conversation with her as well. Um, the book is called, if you want to get it before next week, it's called The Generative Age with the AI locked up. Um, but So that'll be fun um, to talk to her. Um, you, you have anything else you'd like to say that would uh, tell us why we should come listen to what she has to say? Or what you're, you said a lot about the project you've worked on already, but yeah. Well, I just, Alana is incredibly passionate about this evolving technology. She, you know, she hosts a podcast for NiceGate, which I know not everyone's from New York here, but it's, it's our ed tech um, and computer science organization for the state. And she's really, um, you know, staying at the forefront of all the changes that are happening so fast. Um, and, you know, she sees, she has a lot of really great, wonderful ideas and thoughts about using it. So. Well, cool. Thank you, everybody. And feel free to jump off. I'm going to keep talking to Rohan, who's jumped in here and 
see if anybody else wants to feel free. Um, just because they've come, but Rohan, do you do you want to jump in and how are you doing? I'm going to stop um, recording for for this part of the. Um, <laughs> David called it a double header a couple weeks ago. 